Manager at Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies. In our discourse today, an historical contextualization of the role of women in labor will be presented with special emphasis on the importance of having women in positions of authority throughout the local trade union movement. On our panel today, we have Professor Rhoda Ruddock, Emerita Professor of Gender, Social Change and Development at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus. We have Ms. Sati Gajida Innes, Second Vice President, Oilfield Workers Trade Union. Ms. Sharon Lacan King, Secretary of the Northern Branch Trinidad and Tobago Registered Nurses Association and Ms. Alicia Roberts, former Executive Officer, Communication Workers Union. The format of today's webinar is as follows. Um, each of the presenters today will have, will have uh, seven minutes to present. Um, this will be followed by engagement by the moderator, myself. And then we'll open the floor to discussion with questions from the viewers online. Um, in this vein, I urge you, you can type your questions in the chat box on the right hand side of your screen. We will go to Professor Rhoda Reddock. Um, I will I will I will ask Mr. Ms. Professor Rhoda Reddock to present. Let me, before she presents, let me just give a brief bio. Um, Professor Rodok is Emerita Professor of Gender, Social Change and Development at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus. She has also served as the Deputy Principal and the first head of the Institute for Gender and Development Studies. She's active in the National and Caribbean Women's Movement and other social causes. Professor Rodok is the recipient of numerous national, regional, and international awards, including the Triennial Caricom Award for Women in 2002, and an honorary doctorate from the University of Western Cape, South Africa in 2012. Professor Rudder is currently an executive member of the International Sociological Association and an elected expert of the UN Committee for the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. Professor Radok, you have the floor. Thank you very much. And I'd like to congratulate the Emma Francois Institute. And I think it's very appropriate that the Emma Francois Institute is organizing this webinar as Emma Francois in a way could be seen as the mother of trade unionism in Trinidad and Tobago, although many do not know about her. If we looked at some of the newspapers today, I think I counted on one newspaper about four articles of, about Butler, which is great. He's one of our heroes. And I think there were no articles on most of the other leaders and certainly none on Elma Franco or any of the women leaders. I did see a very small ad that mentioned uh, the labor heroes and Elma Franco's photo was included. So I think that uh, it's great that there's this institute that's named after her because Elma Franco was responsible for the formation of at least four trade unions in Trinidad and Tobago. She was part herself and her organization, and many of those trade unions still exist today. This include the Federated Workers Trade Union, which is now part of the NUGFW, the Public Works and Public Services Union, which could be said to be a forerunner of the public. It's June 19th which commemorates that day in 1937 when the so-called Butler riots took place. It's also noted that the riot did not only happen in Faisabad, although Faisabad, I think, is a great uh, location because of that very important event that took, there, took place there so many years ago. But what many of us don't know is that there were disturbances that were taking place 
in other parts of the country, in the north of the country, in Tobago. So the, the protests had spread throughout the country, although the south, the oil field areas, and Faisabad were in many ways the center for the events that were happening at that time. So the point that I want to make, therefore, is that from the establishment of the formal trade union movement, women were involved because Emma was not the only woman who was involved in those early movements, but she certainly was a very important one. Now, I think in looking at women and the labor movement, we need to look at women's labor and women's work because this is very important especially as there are many myths related to women's work, which continue to affect the way in which women's work is valued today. So for example, there's a the myth that long ago, all women used to stay at home and take care of children, and it's only nowadays they're coming out of the home. Now, this is a very powerful ideology. I refer to it as a colonial domestic ideology because it was established by the, the colonialists and through the education system, through the church and other religious systems and through the education system. Uh, it was even eventually integrated into our labor laws, which I will go into a little later. So I wanted us to go back to the beginnings of our society to look at what women's work would have looked like. Now, in the past, in fact, just yesterday on the radio, I heard somebody saying, who are these first peoples? Where did they come from? We don't know anything about them. I think we didn't, today with the whole debate on the Columbus statue, we are looking, some of us for the first time, at the situation of the first peoples, who of course were here long before Columbus passed through. And at the time of the conquest, which is what is usually used to describe the time when the Spanish uh, officially colonized Trinidad, not Tobago, the people who inhabited these, this island, there were different groups. There would have been the Napoyo, the Locono, who would later be called Araks, etc. At the time of the conquest, these first peoples were primarily hunters and gatherers and horticulturists in that they, they dealt with the land as it existed. They hunted, which is probably why Trinis still feel they have to hunt everything. They gathered, they, 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 they used the flora and fauna around us for their survival. They used the, the fruits, and berries to eat for food. They use the cassava, which is one of the indigenous uh, people's crops to produce food. Uh, they, they use the different reeds and the strings to make material for their, to weave clothing, to weave materials for their roofs. And they use the soil, etc., to build their homes. And women were very much part of these the domestic life and economy of these early societies. Now men would have been primarily hunters and fishers and women the gatherers and the horticulturists. And unlike what is commonly felt, meat was not a major part of the food. Meat was actually quite unreliable because men could go off hunting and remain in the forest for three days, but families had to continue to survive. So it was a gathering and the horticulture provided by women that was the main source of food. So traditionally, the sexual division of labor in those indigenous communities, uh, women would be responsible for planting, weeding, harvesting, agricultural activities, food preparation, spinning and weaving, cotton and pottery, which would be the utensils, collecting wild veg vegetables and small animals, etc. Now, when we, so women's work therefore was foundational to our history. So in addition to the work that the first peoples did before the conquest, the women who came 
in the wake of the conquest, all the majority were brought here as workers. And I think this is very important for us to remember when people tell us how long ago. Remember that the majority of our ancestors came here as enslaved or indentured laborers, mainly from the African continent and the Indian subcontinent. And even among some of the other groups that also came, many of them included women workers, especially the the poorer communities among the groups, Chinese, Madeirans, Portuguese, etc., who came. And these, the indigenous people after the conquest were organized into encomiendas and repartimentos, different labor systems, and eventually into the Catholic church missions through which they worked for the, the church as well as the Spanish colonialists. Now, what we do know in enslavement is that women didn't work in the house, as is traditionally thought, but were the majority of workers in the field. And, and this is very important. And many of them survived the work on the plantation. So that by the end of slavery in many of the countries of the Caribbean, the majority of field laborers were women. And in fact, male workers had many of the skilled tasks because, al because already we see the already we see the the um, the inequalities beginning to set up in that the men were often given, even though men were also field laborers, and some men were servants in the home. Yes, so that many of the men were part of were given the skilled, skilled tasks in the plantation, which meant that they had certain privileges over others. I now want to go to the post-emancipation period. And I think what is so interesting about the post-emancipation period was that even though women worked so well in the plantations and survived but at a better, survived, more than men, as soon as wage labor was introduced, women earned less than men. And this was true in the plantations that continued, and it were continued when Indian indentured laborers were introduced, where Indian women were paid less than men, whatever task they were assigned to be part of. Now, what is important is that as, as some middle classes emerged, some women began working not only in agriculture, but also some worked in shops and stores in Port of Spain, and a few were working in the civil service and as teachers. And it's interesting that in the 1930s, legislation was passed that made it against the law for married women to continue to work in the civil service or to continue to be teachers. And there was introduced something that still exists, I believe, I hope not, in our public service law, which is that women may retire on grounds of marriage, something that men were never able to. And this is because marriage at the time was seen as a full-time career for women, whereas it was never seen as a full-time career for men. So. In the 1930s, this was made compulsory. And then after years of struggle, it was eventually not compulsory. But I think still today, women may retire if they so wish on the grounds of marriage. The other thing I want to note is that many of the improvements in worker status in Trinidad and Tobago were achieved as a result of historical struggle. We know of the water riots of 1903, the labor disturbances of Port of Spain in 1919, the 1937 disturbances, and there were also disturbances in 1947. And in each one of these, all the data shows that women, sometimes with their children, were among significant proportions of the workers demonstrating at this time. Now in the 1940s, after the 1937 disturbances, 
the colonial state felt it was time to introduce trade unions formally. Now, there were some labor organizations prior to that, but they did not have all the recognition of trade unions. But it was felt that the introduction of trade unions would serve to organize these workers and control their, their activities so that they wouldn't have all of these riots and disturbances that had happened in the past. And indeed, they were very successful in that organized or what is called as responsible trade unions were very important in managing the conflict between management or employers and workers. Now, one of the, I think it's important to know of this history of women in trade unions, because you would not believe that women have this tradition and history if you look at the leadership of trade unions today. I think trade unions continue to be one of the most resistant to women's leadership in our country and our region. I think the image of a trade unionist of a big bad man who could shout louder than whoever the, the, the conflict is with, in a way makes it difficult for many women, unless they could be bigger and badder, to be granted the leadership that trade unions believe that they require. And this is interesting, even in, in, in employment situations where the majority of workers are female, the leadership of their unions continues to be predominantly male. And therefore we have a tradition of trade union leadership that is very masculinized, very confrontational, very macho, and in a way has not really given attention to the issues that confront women workers in the, the, the seriousness that they deserve. And my time has probably ended, so I just wanted to identify what are some of the issues that women workers require. Now, motherhood is a very important uh, capability that women have, and indeed it's a privilege. And, but in the labor situation, Pregnancy is often treated as something that one does for spite, almost, and something that is done, uh, that is a personal responsibility. When in fact, if women did not produce children, there would be no labor and there would be no future generation of workers or citizens. So I think the value of women's reproductive capacity and not only the capacity, but their willingness to bear children is something that our society has still not recognized. We do not have adequate daycare facilities for, for children, either in workplaces, in communities, or in homes. We still assume that it's a woman's responsibility to find somebody to take care of her children. And this is a responsibility that employers, the state, the entire society needs to take seriously. But unfortunately, I think that many times this is not a priority for many of our, our trade unions. In addition, I think in Trinidad and Tobago and most of the Caribbean, women's income tends to be lower than male income. And this is so even though women have more years of education and more educational qualifications than men. And this is because jobs that are traditionally conceptualized as feminine are given lower pay. And it has nothing to do with the quality of the work or the importance of the work. So that, uh, so that we need to look at that. Why is it that jobs that are traditionally conceptualized as feminine earn less? And it's not because the job is less, but what happens is that any job that becomes defined as feminine gets lower value and lower remuneration. Now, there are lots of other things I could say about the ways in which the trade union can better harness the power, the vision, and the knowledge of women. And that knowledge is not just to leave the trade union movement where it is, but to transform it and to make it in the kind of institution that really contributes to the social and political transformation of the entire society. But I think that may be a discussion for another day. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, Professor uh, Rhoda Redder, for that insightful and informative presentation. Uh, it took us all the way back to pre-colonial days and it emphasized the, um, um, the importance of, and the role that women played in, in civilization before Columbus. Um, it took us post-emancipation and even up to present day. Some of the issues she highlighted today that, that exist today, um, uh, pregnancy and the conceptualization of, of jobs, jobs that are defined as feminine, you know, and um, the, the value that places on the job and, and, and payment and, sorry, and salaries and all that um, in society today. So thank you again for that insightful and informative um, contribution and presentation. Um, let me just, to our viewers, let me just um, apologize for the um, interruption or disruption of service. Um, our Two of our um, panelists, Ms. Um, Sati Gajada and Ms. Sharon Lakan are at Faizabad. However, they, um, they saw it fit. They know the importance of, um, they share the importance of this um, webinar series, hence the reason they are here. With that said, um, I'd like to introduce our next uh, presenter, Ms. Sati Gajada Innes, uh, Ms. Innes. Upon becoming an executive at, on PowerGen Branch Committee in 1996, uh, served in positions of extra delegate and branch president before she was appointed to the union's national executive as an executive trustee in 2006. She was later appointed to the position of vice president in 2014 and second vice president in 2017, a position she holds today. As part of her role within the union, she has been active in the Labor Relations Department of the OWTU from 2006. Having sat on a number of boards over the years, Ms. Gajida Innes is currently a member of the Registration, Recognition and Certification Board as one of the Labor's representatives. She is presently involved in an industrial, all industrial gender forming policy with emphasis on women in Latin America and the Caribbean. Mrs. Gajida Innes. Yes, good afternoon, greetings. I bring you greetings from the OWTU Butler Hall of Revolution in Faisabad on Labor Day 2020. This is where it all began in 1937. Our forefathers of the labor movement, along with our grandmothers, mothers and sisters would have left their homes and walked shoulder to shoulder demanding better working conditions, higher wages, and also demanding a greater participation in the decision making of the country. Those women leaders would have created a path for us to follow today. Having worked in an early, from an early age in a male dominated environment, I personally cannot attest to being treated differently. However, based on my interactions with members, international affiliates, and my experience as a female in the trade union movement, I must admit that a gap does exist with regards to inequity and disparities in workplaces with regards to females. Presently, there are females right here in Trinidad and Tobago and other places of the world that still that are still being paid lower than their male counterparts. Some still facing se sexual harassment and being assigned roles and functions based on their gender. The national gender policy is still only a green paper today. There is need for policies, comrades, gender policies in our trade unions. The OWTU realizing this gap is working with industrial, the global trade union body to create a gender policy. Once approved by the union's executive, 
it will also form part of our proposal when preparing for negotiations. The goal of the goal of this would include a safe and free environment from sexual harassment at the workplace and during union activities and meetings. It will promote an inclusive and gender sensitive culture and ensure equal opportunities in recruitment within the union and workplaces. It would ensure meetings are held in a safe and convenient meeting in safe and convenient meeting spaces and with a duration that is appropriate for workers with families responsibilities and if necessary even daycare facilities women would be protected significantly in the workplace and within the union the trade union movement calls for the ratification of ILO Convention C-190, Violence and Harassment Convention 2019, number 190. The ultimate aim is to ensure women become visible, respected, and ensure that the gender perspective is present in all areas, both in the union and workplaces also to develop strategies to unionize women, focus on issues that are of interest to them, such as eliminating the wage gap through collective bargaining, advocating for equal employment and, advoca and advocacy opportunities, addressing gender-based violence, maternity and paternity leave. And these are just some of the things that it should the policy should cover and we should look forward to additionally the goal is to ensure more females step forward and take up the leadership roles within the trade unions let us pre prepare our young female members to take their seats at the table where they would have a voice and not just sit as token representation i thank you Okay, so our next presenter is Mrs. Al Ms. Alicia Roberts. Ms. Alicia Roberts was a former executive officer of the Communication Workers Union, where she held the position of research officer for the period 2015 to 2017. Mrs. Ms. Roberts is the holder of a Master of Arts degree in history from the University of the West Indies. Ms. Roberts, you may take the floor. Uh, good afternoon to Trinidad and Tobago, um, also to my fellow uh, sisters um, who are taking time out to be on this webinar this afternoon. It is a privilege and a pleasure um, to be on this panel with such esteemed colleagues, Professor Redock, one of my um, former teachers, um, Sister Sati that I would have known from OWM from OWT and being in the labor movement. So good afternoon to everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as a former executive officer of the Communication Workers Union, when I went on the board in 2008, I looked at the trade union that I was in, Communication Workers Union, and as well as other unions, and I noticed something. The ratio of men to women on the board was a bit startling, taking into consideration that women would be now making up at least 40% of the workforce and growing and trade unions being the vibrant organization that it is supposed to be and representing their members. Why women were not coming to the forefront in leadership positions? And so therefore, um, I decided to make, make that the, the focus of my study. And it was quite um, enlightening to, um, you know, from to the genesis from when trade unions started till now, contemporary times, why women are not taking up that mantle of um, leadership. And one of the things I realized is that, um, you know, confidence where women are concerned is, is it's sadly lacking, right? We need to be confident with ourselves and comfortable with ourselves to take up that mantle of leadership. 
it's not easy, especially if you know the history of trade unions where they were based on skilled labor or then in trades. And to break, to break that door down and to actually get onto to an executive board in those times would have been difficult. But now it's supposed to be slightly easier, not so. But still, women are not taking up that role. We're still seeing ourselves um, being supporting the men. So I just want to, you know, have a, a, a presentation here. So I'm going to, you know, bring up um, my presentation, right? Okay. So I hope everyone is seeing here. So that you'll see that women have made strides in their in their involvement in the trade unions. And they're still, as I said, not taking up leadership positions, right? And even though they contribute to the majority of the labor force that the union represents. So of course, you would have seen, of course, Professor Redock talk about Emma Francois and Clotilde Walcott. She was another prominent trade unionist in Trinidad and Tobago, and she was instrumental in forming the National Union of Domestic Employees, NUD. And her daughter, Ida LeBlanc, is now taking up that fight where domestic workers are concerned. And of course, we have Jennifer Batiste Primus. You can't erase her from history. She's now gone into politics. But of course, she is. she was the first female um, president of PSA, a long running organization, trade union organization in Trinidad and Tobago. And of course, in my research, I, I, I did not stop only in Trinidad. I went outside and of course, um, Lynn Boyles in 1996, she wrote a book called We Paid Our Dues, and she spoke about tra female trade unionists in the region of Jamaica, like Aggie Bernard, Edith Nelson, Alcyon Glasspool, and Bertha Mott from St. Vincent, to name a few. Now, we have to know a little bit about what would have started these roadblocks, you know, that women would not take up the mantle. And of course, you have to look at gender history, which is very important. And gender history would have started with that revolutionary time, which is in the 60s, where the feminist movement, they clamored for space, for voices, for the achievement of women to be heard. They wanted her story to come out because his story, and I mean, it's history, is there. But what about her story? And of course, when you have to break down the door or break patriarchal attitudes, that is a problem. And it showed that women were left empowered wherever they were in the workforce that they were, that they, they did not feel empowered enough to speak. So gender history started in the 60s and it was from there that women decided that, look, we need to be heard. And of course, another roadblock is that, you know, if you look even as far as Britain, where women were excluded from the skilled and better paying jobs. So, and ironically, unions had a part in restricting women from getting better, better paying jobs. You know, they felt, and of course, patriarchal system again, that women were more um, suited to domesticated roles, you know, the cooking, the cleaning, the washing, the taking care of the children at home. So even though new unions were starting up in the 19th century, right, men saw women as a threat, as a menace, and they should not have a part where being in trade unionism is concerned or having um, a place at the, at the table, at the head table. Of course, now the braver of the women, when they found themselves in trade unionism, they faced victimization, harassment, and discrimination. And I can tell you that even happens today, because even when I decided to get into um, trade unionism at that time, and I had a discussion with my manager, and I said to him that I'm going to become an officer with the union. His attitude changed because I would have, you know, had to take time off and stuff like that. Why would someone like you get into the union? But it was the union that helped me to, to able, you know, get better wages. And I had the issue and they helped me. So why would I not give back, you know, contribute towards this trade union that helped me? And it was really remarkable to see a 360 degree with his treatment towards me. And it still happens with women when they join the trade union. And historically, you had Elma Francois, where in St. Vincent, where she worked at a beatnik sugar factory for organizing her fellow workers. She, they fired her. And because she couldn't find employment, 
she migrated to Trinidad and Tobago. And of course, women at that time were mostly found occupying the middle leadership of the unions. And of course, their roles restricted, you know, slightly domestic again, restricted to chairing the committees and being the union's secretaries. And of course, male dominance in the trade union. That was a part of that. You know, they were born in the workplaces in the skilled trades made up of men. So as a woman, you're out of place. What are you doing there? So of course, you know, they have the ideology of the family wage. So if I am the man and I am the breadwinner, I have the say. So this was used to undermine the role of the woman, you know, to attain equal pay. And it, it solidified the case of differential job access and lower pay. So ironically, cheap labor was viewed by men as a threat to their jobs. And as a result, the unions tried to control female access to the labor market. And of course now, with that, if a woman decides I'm going to be brave enough to get there, when they're facing this ad, you know, adversity, they will get scared and shy away from these leadership duties. And of course, if you're hearing it in your ears, you know, like a subliminal messages, you're not good for that, you're just good for the kitchen, you know, well then, of course, it will become embedded in you. And then you'll say, well, all right, I wouldn't go for this anymore. And of course, they were decided to accept their roles as being subordinate in these organizations. And of course, <laughs> well, I wouldn't say of course, surprisingly, there were women who found that, you know, women getting into that aspect of trade unionism. That's a no, no, what are you going there? You're going to rub a rose with these men? That's, that's not womanly. That's not feminine. For example, you have the Preston Spinner strike of 1853, where women engaged in strike action. And they supported the men in demands that they were paid higher wages to enable the male workers to keep their wives at home. So you have women joining in a struggle to support the men for them to stay home. Isn't that ironic? And of course, others could not join because they were too busy with their home affairs and the unions being too male dominated and married life being hectic. Hmm. They decide not to go there. So even as late as 1970, there was no real imperative for women to assume leadership roles in the trade union movement. And of course, as I said before, um, the documentation of these struggles, it's not easy to find all the time. And of course, the responsibilities of Caribbean women, they're multifaceted, but not documented. And so the lives of resistance, their lives of struggle, you know, it's lost. We're not hearing about it. We have to be lucky that if there are still women alive today in that era could talk to us and give us some information on how it was for them and how they overcame their, their struggle or their, maybe their lack of the confidence and said, I'm going to go for it. But unfortunately, it's lost because they are dying out and we don't have those records. Um, <clears throat> Also, the number of women that went to the factories, you know, after the World Wars, you know, women replaced the men on the production lines to maximize the war effort. And most of the labor struggles, of course, especially in Trinidad Tobago, occurred in the 1930s, and women played an integral part. So, of course, women could be found in the rile and flank of the of the leadership of the membership, but not in the leadership. Membership but not the leadership. Of course, you had the union of shop assistants and clerks, and it, it organized a, a large number of women, women, sorry. This union had evolved from the clerks union of the Trinidad Labor Party. And in its membership, there were a number of poorly paid women of the stores and shops. And ironically, in the clerks internal elections in 1935, even though there were you know, a large number of women, not one woman vied for an executive post until 1935, when Ms. Casabon was elected to the position of vice president and six other women were elected to the management committee. So of course we have our outstanding women pioneers like Elma Francois, as Professor Radok said, she was instrumental in, a, in the formation of unions in Trinidad and Tobago. And she was the first a member of the Trinidad Working Men's Association and then she assisted in laying the groundwork of the formation of three major unions, the Seamen and Waterfront Workers Union, the National 
Union of Government and Federated Workers Trade Union, just to name a few. And of course, we go to OWTU, Sister Sati. Of course, you should know of Daisy Crick, um, who was a founding member of the OWTU and was the leader of the Women's Auxiliary of the OWTU and the first female president of the library branch. And of course, with OWTU, after the World War, there was a resurgence in union activity. And of course, the women you know, became involved in union activities and they had their women's auxiliary, auxiliary, which was supportive in nature and mostly assisted the men in their struggles. Of course, as I said before, you know, they made up 40% of a growing labor force, yet their numbers in the trade union movement seem to be stagnant or diminishing due to their lack of involvement in the hierarchy of these unions. And of course, as the conditions improved and the union became in the union men, they, you know, they became inclined to discourage their wives in union activities, with the exception, of course, of Daisy Crick. And of course, we have um, Lionel Beckles, who was the general secretary of the OWTU. He wrote in the Vanguard, and I quote, the, fun the functions of the women's auxiliary was to assist their men in the struggle to raise the standard of living of the workers and their families, you see, to assist. And unfortunately, auxiliary declined because, you know, some people moved away from the oil fields and the thing died, the auxiliary died in the 60s and 70s because there was no space for them. Why, why an auxiliary? There was no need for them. And so the women's auxiliary is just there on paper, but it does not exist anymore. And coincidentally, I had a meeting, I had an interview with Sister Sati in 2011 when I was doing this research. And she said to me, that women, especially in OWTU, have come a long way from having a supporting role in the union. It is better to be an officer on the executive board and have a voice instead of being in a body that has no representation on the board. So in Sister Sati's view, and I'm paraphrasing, that it would have been better to be on that board and have a voice. A woman auxiliary, that's just a helpmeet. Why be a helpmeet when you can have a voice? Strive to be among the men and be heard. So there we have the past officers of OWTU. And then another, uh, uh, I looked at CWU, the organization that I belong to. And in the CWU, in our constitution, I want you to look carefully. The executive board may organize a women's auxiliary section within the framework of the union subject to the ratification of its aims, objects, and functions by the general council. And I can tell you now that that women's auxiliary, it, it existed, but unfortunately, because when they had um, issues like negotiations and protests, um, the auxiliary and what it stood for, that also became defunct. So now that is just also on paper, but there's no body that exists within the CW as a woman's auxiliary. And here you have a picture of one of our stalwarts. Her name is Sister An Chan Chow. And I had asked her about, you know, do you think in these times that we should have a woman's auxiliary? And she said to me that she saw the woman's auxiliary as being a space, you know, where, where the women can meet and discuss about what's going on with them and their lives. And they can talk about establishing a daycare and having a safe place for, for, for women to speak. So why have a woman's auxiliary where you have a safe space for women to speak? Well, why can't we speak with our men on an executive board? And that's something that we should look at. And of course, as I said, you have Jennifer Petit's Primus who um, attained uh, you know, a status with being the first female leader of an organization as a PSA in Trinidad and Tobago. And she said to me that when I interviewed her, that she said one thing she realized that when she was an officer before she obtained um, the post of president, that she said that one thing she realized is that, you know, there was a subliminal, subliminal way that men would influence women to carry out the traditional functions. And most times when you, when you have the meetings, who do you see serving sandwiches? Who do you see serving the tea? That's, that's one of the problems that even though that we get into these positions, that we still gravitate towards the 
only charge. No, no, okay. And that um, she also remarked that, you know, that another problem, another roadblock that a woman might not want to gain, you know, get into that because, you know, once women become involved in union activities, the husband or the boyfriend starts to add pressure to the woman. Hmm, something to think about. He has this image in his mind that his woman is going into an organization with all these men. And some of these men can't take that. And she also said to me that another issue that, that would hamper us from attaining these positions is that we lack the confidence in ourselves and also lack of support from our fellow sisters. And, you know, of course, Tutor, they have a committee. Um, they also have a committee for the status on women where the start this committee is comprised of five women and two men and where they look at gender issues etc and it facilitate the training of women to aspire for leadership roles so maybe that's what we need that we need committees that would train women empower women to get into these roles to to, to actually not only fight for our, our our men but fight for the issues of women fight for the issues of children Now, of course, you see the organizational structure, and I want, to look, I want you to look at the gender ratio, and that would have been between the period of 1990 to 2011, and it has not changed it now. Of the ratio and the composition of men to women, 10 men to women on a board. That was 1999 to 2004, nine to three, 10 to two. You see that ratio? And then even if you go towards, um, if you look at, tutor on the board. And strangely enough, there are a lot, uh, in the teaching system, it's mostly women. But look at the composition of tutor at that period. Four, men four, women two. That's the period 1990 to 1998. Men five, women one. So you can see the ratio there. And even in, from my union, CWU, elected national officers, Look at the ratio of men to women, nine to two, 10 to one, nine to two. Ten. And these trends have not changed. So how are we going to combat this? How are we going to get into leadership positions that will change the voice, that will enhance dialogue, that will push us to not knock down the walls of this patriarchal system, right? We have to have more educational opportunities, right? We have to have more role models. We have to change the society, right? You know, they have to get families to support them. For more women to be involved in union work, it would mean that union activity would have to be restructured to allow family commitments and not to downplay them. To accommodate the schedules of women and their responsibilities, that union would have to drop the 24 hour a day model for leadership and to look to job sharing, flexi time, and other similar work practices that they can advocate in negotiations. That. Now, Needleman, who I use as, a, as, a, as one of my sources, believe that these changes would make leadership more accessible to more workers and would also greatly enhance the trade union's organizing capacity. So we can have more training sessions for women, um, let them go outside there in the field. We also have to make sure that our sisters understand that it's not that just because I'm a woman, it doesn't mean that I can't handle the situation. Maybe as a woman, I see things that my male counterparts are not seeing, but I want my voice to be heard and not be less confident than the male, especially if you're having the same training opportunities, be just as confident. And we have to advocate that if we're doing the same job, we want the same pay. Because I don't think it's a, it's a matter of of because I'm a woman and I'm in this position that it has to be downgraded to be a feminine thing. No, if we are looking at better men for the membership, it's male and female. So why don't we have more men in our more women in our leadership? We need to get away from that. The fact that being in a trade union or oh, it's a man thing, it's a it's a rabble rousing. No, as women we can bring strong femininity into it that we can be listened to and that we have great ideas. We see differently from men, yes, but that doesn't mean that our views and our objectives are less important than our male counterparts. 
it is just as equal. At the end of the day, when we have finished our trade union duties, we have to see about our husband and our, our husband, our children. And aren't we leaders in our households? So that is something that we need to think about. And thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Roberts, for that incitive and informative um, presentation. Um, you basically presented, um, you charted the roadblocks, roadblocks, the historical roadblocks that women um, have faced with respect to leadership positions. You even highlighted his story versus her story. Um, you, you, you looked at the chronology of roadblocks um, of roadblocks women face in the trade union movement. And well, you ended on a more positive note in terms of um, the achievements you made despite that and what needs to be done in terms of um, embracing women in the trade union movement, embracing women in, 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 the, in the movement, restructuring the trade union activities, et cetera. Thank you very much. Ms. Sharon Lacan King has been in the nursing fraternity for at least 20 years as a registered nurse, for at least 16 years and in the active trade union, unionism for at least three years. She recently completed a diploma in industrial relations program at the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies and has invested herself into educating and empowering nursing personnel about industrial relations and their rights as workers. Ms. Lacan King. All right, so um, much of what I had in my presentation was echoed by the other presenters that have gone before. So I'm looking at the time, it's already minutes to four, so I'm not going to take much time by going through this again. I just pull out this, the, the points that I would like to build on. So um, following in the footsteps of um, my president, Mr. Eddie Stewart, the TTRNA would have been, as we said before, nursing is predominantly a female profession. We are, there are some men in, in, in our numbers, but it's mostly women. And women, we have a lot of challenges having to work and manage the home as well. So in empowering women, what we would advocate for, what we are advocating for, and I, I, I know that some of our presenters here, co-panelists would have mentioned it as well, is workplace child care facilities. Um, I was looking at the ILO document with regards to um, workplace solutions um, regarding child care, and they cited that absenteeism most times are associated with um, parental duties, having to take a day for going to PTA, having to take a day because the child is not well and stuff like that. And even with regards to caring for the elderly and the special needs persons um, in our families. So we would like, we want to see, and this would empower women among us and not just um, in nursing, but generally um, to be able to give of their best, to give the best output into the labor that they are doing, knowing that um, the responsibilities with regard to childcare and these other little things that add up um, are being taken care of. Um, another thing that um, came up some time before was um, in, the, in our services, we do not have um, special provision for leave that will allow you to go and attend to those um, situations. Like if a child falls ill, you have to apply for a sick leave on your behalf. So there's nothing right now that provides for you to, um, to do certain things that, are, that take you away from work without having to apply for a sick leave. So th that's another thing. And um, when we speak about gender bias and, and um, gender based discrimination, the nursing fraternity is the um, only 
I think maybe seconded by teachers, female dominated group of the essential services. Yet we are the one of the lowest paid of the essential services compared to our male dominate uh, male counterparts in the male dominated groups of the essential services. Um, so recently we had made a proposal to the Minister of Health with regards to hazard allowance, ha sorry, hazard pay uh, health insurance, which is something we don't have, while our male counterparts do enjoy those. Something that was mentioned earlier by one of the panelists was that um, marriage um, in previous times you would have to leave the service on account of marriage or to take care of the um, the children um, that was considered a career and as the ILO document had put it it's the non-paid employment that women were engaged in and we still are engaged in it because we're going out to work so there's paid employment here and then when we get back home we still have to perform other duties which are unpaid um, so those are some of the points that i had listed here for us to develop on later on so um thank you very much for the opportunity and i look forward to the discussions um so you basically so you basically um outlined um the things that some of the things that need to be in place to make the working environment more conducive so that nurses and women as a whole can give their best you know um to their job and some of those things included um child care facilities uh you mentioned equity with respect to allowances etc Okay, um, so we have about 20 minutes for us to look at the, go into our questions. So we have, we have some questions. Um, our first question is from Bisham Baldeo, right? And I'll pose this to the floor. Anyone on the floor could answer this one. Since the Elmo France, what time? No other woman woman has become famous in the trade union movement. Why is this? First of all, I'm not sure what he means by famous. I mean, women have done. There have been women in the trade union movement who have, who have achieved a lot. Not as many as we would like, you know. But I don't know if just coming maybe the names are not known but i just like to say that nobody knew about elma francois until some of us began to do research in the 1970s and 80s so before that she wasn't famous so in fact a lot of women's history is lost and of course we don't do much history in schools we don't even do enough history in the labor movement I really believe that trade unions should have discussion groups and discuss things like labor history, labor laws. I think if you do that, you'll find a lot more people coming out and being part. But that education aspect, I think we've lost a lot of that. So that um, I think only when people began to do research, we found out that she wasn't famous before. So maybe if we did some more research, we might be find some other woman becoming famous. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, that is true. Especially, I think um, Alicia Roberts made the the point that you know it, it's his story, not her story. And a lot of we have a lot of male perspectives of history, and you know, as a result, that is one of the reasons why some some most women were left out of history and their stories were unheard. Um, um, I would like to I'd like to also comment on that as um, you know picking up from um, what Professor Redock said. Being in a trade union movement is not a glamorous job. So when he said famous, I was trying to figure out you don't go into it for fame. I don't know if that is how he looks at the labor movement. It's not fame and glory. You're looking to represent members, membership, the floor, the ground. So it's it's nothing. It's not to do with famous. And where women are concerned, as I said, his story has always dominated the scene. Her story 
And we have to start writing or continue writing her story. But not only in Trinidad and Tobago, it's throughout the region. There's, a, there's information out there. It's to find it, to find these people that would have made a, a remarkable contribution to the history of Trinidad and Tobago. So it's not, not a matter of being famous. And look, um, you know, I think Professor Radock said something remarkable to me about the presence of women in trade, trade unionism, you know, being highlighted. And someone just sent me a text, don't forget um, that the president of Tutor, this, it's a woman, she's a woman, Tiru, Sister Judy Charles. Um, and, and unfortunately, these women, you know, I, I can't remember seeing, you know, their pictures in the papers today. I, I'm going to have to look through it again. So it's not a matter of being famous. It's creating history. So maybe, you know, maybe this is, I'm just probably being biased here that going forward when it comes to, you know, capturing the history of labor laws, et cetera, and create, we have to have her story, a different genre. We have to get a niche that we can, you know, and expand on it. Okay. All right. The next question is from Michelle Clavery, and she wants to know, how do we transform, given the, what, what we know now and what, what the situation is, how do we or how can we transform the trade union movement? This is a general question as well. Let me just um, say that, as I mentioned before, forming proper policies, internal policies for your trade union is, is key. Because if we form policies giving guidance as to the ratio of representation, whether it is at the executive level, whether it is at attending different forums, then certainly we will have more participation but developing a proper policy is key and important and educating our members of the importance of being part of activities. Anyone else? No? I was thinking that Alicia Roberts put forward some very interesting alternatives. I was very intrigued by the discussion on the tutor women because Tutor organization was an auxiliary and it was there to support the, the, the mainstream organization. It was there for the, as I can't remember the title, she can probably explain more. But I think the fact that at the last tutor elections, there were three female candidates for president is probably evidence of the success of their strategy. So maybe Ms. Roberts, you could tell us a little more about that. Um, when I conducted this research would have been around um, 2010. And at that time, the person I spoke with was um, Ms. Savitri Pargas. Uh, of course, at that time, she would have been um, first um, vice president, uh, if my memory is good at this time, yes. So at that time, you know, she was saying that when it came to women, and it was a committee for, the committee for women, that woman, that woman committee that they had in tutor, she said like, you know, is it was like, a, you know, that, that position she was in, you know, they have that committee, but the position that she was in as the president there in tutor was, it was it as it was a given. Now I would believe that now things have um, progressed since then. So as, as, as you said that there were three women who went up for elections for tutor, that was remarkable, I remember hearing that and I said, wow. And I said, it was, a, it was about time. It was about time because from since I was a child until and until I was an executive board, I would have known that tutor, I would have been hearing about um, Trevor Oliver and Mr. Garcia and Ralston. So to hear now that there's a woman at the helm and three women contested for the position of president, it was remarkable and congratulations to them. And um, I would hope in the future that with other organizations as well, that women, um, you know, um, go up for the more women um, 
make strides and challenge for the leadership of their in their um, unions. All right, so um, the next question uh, is from Jalen Panton. And his question is, how can females take a money active or forward role in the trade union movement if there are no real opportunities to do so? It seems to be a boys club. Ms. Gajida? Yeah, but um, money active. Um, at OWCU, while at our executive level, it's, it's only two females out of the 12. And it is not, trade unionism is not a money-making business, but yet we have employed in our education department. Continuously, we have very educated women serving at that level, at the education committee level. So and they and they are and they are compensated for the work they do. They you know, but to say trade unionism is you know, I don't understand the money making part of it because sometimes you do a job or you will go into a job and you might get other opportunities that might be paying more. But if you really love that job, you will stay there. So because I'm sure some of the nurses might say they, they, they're not making as much money, but they, they go into the job and they love it and they stay. So, you know, it is not about money making, trade unionism. Anybody that gets into it for that reason is the wrong reason. If at, especially serving at the executive level, if you're an employee, if you get in there, of course it is different. Okay. Uh, the next question is from uh, Marcia Constantine. Um, again, it's for anyone at, in the, on the panel. Is it that women are not taking the leadership role or is, is, that, or is that the system set up to block women to assume those roles? I um, think um, thinking she's talking about the trade union movement or the system i would say it's a combination of both and the point i was trying to make is that the trade the trade unions currently have a certain culture and a way of operating and that does that is not always easy or attractive to women so therefore even though they never say we don't want women or we keep out women you know everybody can go up there are other things that that discourage and i think that that how this has changed is for trade unions themselves to reflect. First of all, they have to really want to do it and to sit back and reflect to see how this could be changed. Now, I just want to make the point. I do think we just, now it's important for women to be in the executive. That's a human right. And it's also a question of equality. But the thing is what difference should women bring? You know, I was hearing, uh, Sharon speak about the issue of the child care services, but I don't hear it. I, you know, I don't see it on any placards. You know, I'm not sure what is the response in the negotiation. That should be a nationwide campaign with all the trade unions giving support if it's an important issue. So I'm saying that that the women have to also, when they get there, they 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 must be they have to be confident enough to make a difference. So getting there is one half. But one Rada, thing, yeah, sorry. Sorry, I, I just got clarification on that question. The person really meant to say more active, not money active, but I believe we were on the right part in terms of addressing the question. I just wanted to um, yes. make that yes, thanks. I think that makes more sense, but I'll stop now and give others a chance. Anyone else will care to respond to that question or shall we move on? Um, taking into account my experience being on the executive board, from being a, a, a officer on the branch, because I started off in Southern Branch, and then getting onto the executive board, that was a, that was a whole different stratosphere. Um, was I trained to go on the executive board? No. And then it was, um, it's 11 of us. And it was only when I got there, when I was elected to the board, it was, it was just two of us, two females on the board. And some of them would have had more experience than myself. 
and I can speak to me that there were times that I was not confident in bringing about a point or bringing up any points. So it was a learning experience for me. So sometimes I would listen instead of making a contribution. And even when I would make a contribution, I would be a bit apprehensive because taking into consideration when men are concerned, they may, they may hear you, but not, you know, not necessarily listen. And there were times when I doubted myself that, that I was making any contribution where my fellow comrades were concerned. But that was me mentally. I can also tell you that it is an all boys network to a certain extent. I'm not, uh, I can be challenged. It is a certain, to a certain extent, it is an all boys network. You have to remember it's Genesis, trade unions Genesis, and it will not be broken that easily. Um, changing and disrupt the patriarchal system in trade unions, in Trinidad and Tobago, in the Caribbean on a whole, is going to take a revolution, a, a different consciousness. And you can get that by, by looking at, by role models, education, it has to be opened up. So that I remember when Sister Anne said to me that we need a space for the training of our women. Yes, we do. We need a space where we can talk to our one another and relay our concerns and our fears. We can't relay that to our comrade brothers, we can't. We cannot. We need each other sometimes to talk, to get it out there. So that when we get in there, right, we have the confidence to stand up and hold fast our point. But when you're dealing sometimes with the male ego, it's sometimes a pull and a tug and a stretch. And you know, sometimes you say that a woman will have to be like a man. No, we don't have to be like a man. Probably a bit smarter, but I'm just being biased. But um, no, it, 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 it sometimes it could be a pulling and a tugging. Yes, to some extent, it is an old boys network. It will take time. It will take a revolution of the mind, a change of the consciousness, but it can happen. Okay. Thank you for that response. Um, we have enough time to take probably two more questions and then we'll wrap up. So um, I don't know, our, our, our viewers um, now starting to get warmed up, but I can only take two more questions. All right. Um, okay, so I'll take this one by Trisha Burton. What is your advice to women facing sexual harassment within the trade union movement? And uh, so, who have been penalized for not complying with requests of male of the male leader? Ms. Gadget, I see you trying to answer. Yes. Um, let me say something. That is, you know, like I said before in, in my um, presentation, growing up in a male environment, nothing passes you, passes by, nothing. And the thing about it is, is that Find somebody to talk about it. Do not keep it to yourself. Find somebody to talk about it. If not in your trade union, it is wrong. Let us not hide it, you know, because too many times what happens is that women, in order to stay in line or to, to be part of the club, they, they try to, you know, to fit in. And staying silent is not the answer. Find somebody to talk to another trade union but speak about it speak out the only way it's going to stop is if we speak out about it all right and the last question for today is um what if, if this is by the um the fire circle and end for an end to gender and child abuse in Trinidad and tobago uh what if anything can gender activists who are not active in the labor movement do to promote gender policies and transform and, and transformation in the trade union movement? I would like to say that I think long ago there was a lot more collaboration between the women's movement and the trade union movement. One of the first public speeches I gave in Trinidad and Tobago was at CWU, the launch of their women's auxiliary many, many years ago. 
So I think that there's a lot of room for education programs and to provide support. For example, I think that the federations themselves, so as Sister Sati said, the federation should develop a sexual har harassment policies for the unions and structures so that there's a clear path, a written policy, so that there's a clear path for staff, workers, members, etc., to follow. And I think that 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 is why a, 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 an organization, a, a move, a, a section for the empowerment of women within the labor movement would be useful to really ensure that all the unions are together, that this is something that needs to be done. So I think that um, that I know that people in the women's movement would be willing to work to, to assist with doing the union histories, the individual union histories, assisting our popular producing videos and popular materials and to doing gender sensitization within the unions. That's what I think would be useful. Yeah, so collaboration is key. Um, anyone else has any contribution, last contribution to this, uh, this our last question? Sharon, would you like to say something? Okay, Sharon, yeah, you've been very quiet. <laughs> Um, a lot of what my thoughts are have been expressed by everybody there. I think women in the labor movement, um, once encouraged to become part, once given the support from their labor, their union, they can become a very active and vibrant force and take the lead of the union. Yes, the male dominance um, factor can be a difficult challenge at times but um i think most unions as was mentioned before the membership is largely women particularly in the service industries so i think once we encourage each other and uphold and support each other we can we can get to those levels and um and be successful at it as well. And just as um, uh, Alicia, is it Alicia? Yeah. Mentioned, okay. we have more and more now, we have more females taking leadership positions of trade unions. My union is a very young one. We've only become a trade union since 2014. But previously we were the professional association for nursing and we have had a numerous amount of female presidents over the years with one or two males in between. And they have done a fantastic job in leading the association to where it is now that we have taken up the mantle of also becoming a trade union to represent the interests of nursing personnel. So I think um, we can continue with encouraging each other, upholding each other, promoting um, um, education um, opportunities and, and those um, socioeconomic welfare. Um, well, we have a socioeconomic welfare committee that assists our members and some of them come up to the ranks of becoming um, members of the executive. So I think that is another factor that we can um, give consideration to. Okay. Each one help one. Yes, and collaboration. So on that note, I'd like to say thank you, Professor Roda, Roda Redock, for that insightful historical discourse of women in, in history and more importantly, women's involvement in trade union movement and labor throughout history. Ms. Gajida Innes, I'd like to also thank you for your, your presentation in terms of informing us about what is on the table with respect to issues in, in, in the movement. And, and Ms. Lacan King, your presentation with respect to um, issues um, that need to be addressed that will make the working environment more conducive so that women can give their best and perform you know, um, at, the, at the workplace. And last but not least, Alicia Roberts, thank you very much for your insightful, illuminating presentation that chronologi 
chronologize the roadblocks that um, women have faced in um, in the trade union movement and um, offering some recommendations. So thank you, our panelists. Thank you, our viewers. All right. Um, we have come to the end of our webinar series. Um, our next webinar series is on uh, Tuesday, 23rd at 5 p.m. It's deconstructing the legal framework for worker protection, right? And the panel comprises um, members of the Department of Labor Studies at Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies. So once again, thank you.